Hi folks, in this video we continue our discussion of our first logical system, Bool. The key concept of Bool is the, that of uh, the Boolean connectives, the sentential connectives. Let me just say that there's a bunch of words that I'm going to use interchangeably. So sometimes people talk about sentential connectives because the Boolean connectives connect onto whole sentences. Sometimes in logical systems, basic atomic sentences are called propositions. So uh, the Boolean connectives are sometimes called propositional connectives. I'm just going to call them connectives for short. And I won't distinguish between sentential connectives or propositional connectives. I'm just going to call them all connectives. Another word for the same thing is operators. Because you, people say that the connectives operate on to some inputs, like the atomic sentences. So I will use the words operators, connectives, sentential connectives, all interchangeably. What is the basic concept here that we're talking about? Um, that's the idea of a piece of language which operates or works on a kind an input, some other bit of the language. So every connective has to have a dot, dot, dot. It has to have this ellipsis, which is a gap where you can put the input into it. And what makes these connectives or operators sentential connectives is because the things you can put in there are whole sentences. So any part of grammar, any part of language will count as a sentential connective or a connective for our purposes if it has a gap and in the gap you can put a whole sentence and the output, the result of that is a new complex grammatically well-formed sentence. So it is true that this is not one of the Boolean connectives, but this does count as a connective according to the definition I just gave you because there's a gap, there's a dot, dot, dot right here and we can insert a grammatically formed whole sentence like it is sunny and now we get a new complex sentence. It is true that it is sunny. That's a grammatically well-formed sentence of English. So that means that it is true that counts as a sentential connective. That same test works for bool. There's a gap right here, and if I insert an atomic sentence like P, then this thing counts as a well-formed sentence. Or ditto um, conjunction. I have to insert things here and here, and I get a complex sentence like uh, P and Q. Okay, let's see if you can apply the definition. Here's a bunch of bits of language. I want you to tell me which ones count as connectives according to that definition. So pause your videos now and um, see if you can figure it out. Remember, um, if, you, if you're if you not gonna put in the work to actually um, use your brain while you're watching these videos, you're not gonna get anything out of it. So pause your videos now. Okay, let's talk about the answers. Um, how about the first one, Pia? Is this a connective? No, we said connectives have to have a gap uh, and in which you can insert something. This is just a name. The grammatical category or syntactic category of this is a name in English, and names are not connectives. There is no gap, so it can't possibly be a connective. How about Ian believes that? Now, this one does have a gap. The question you need to ask yourself is, what can you put in that gap? Can you put a whole sentence, like it is sunny, and get a new sentence? The answer is yes. Um, Ian believes that it is sunny counts as a grammatically well-formed sentence of English. So this is a sentential connective of English. All right, the next one was likes. There was two gaps here. What can you put on the sides of likes? Well, what we need is we need a noun phrase. We need to say like Pia likes logic. Um, so the things that we can put on the sides of likes are not whole sentences. They're nouns or um, objects. This is not a sentential connective because the things that go in its gaps are not whole sentences. I can't say it is sunny likes, it is raining. Uh, sentences don't like things. Uh, so that, that is not a grammatically well-formed sentence. Okay, how about the word because? Um, hopefully you could figure this one out. Because is a difficult one. So uh, I think there's actually two de decent answers. The basic thing I'm looking for is I can put whole sentences on the either side of because here. So I could say like the fire started because lightning struck the tree. This is a whole sentence. The fire started, that's an English sentence. Lightning struck the tree, that's an English sentence. And this, this complex sentence is also a grammatically well-formed sentence. So this does count as a sentential connective. The word because, you might have thought of different examples of because. Um, and because because has this other phrase, it, takes, it can take um, noun clauses, uh, or excuse me, um, it can take propositional clauses like um, because of something. And you might have thought that it's not a, um, a sentential connective for that reason. Like the fire started because of the fire cr cracker or something like that, because of uh, the lightning strike. And of the lightning strike is not a whole sentence. Um, so what I want to say is the definition that we're talking about is just one about, is, it's a permissive definition. It says, as long as you can put a whole sentence in there, then the thing is going to count as a sentential connective. 
So that's why we still want to say it's possible to put a whole sentence here and a whole sentence here and get a new sentence. So we're going to count this as a connective. All right, how about the word or? Um, or is a connective as well. So hopefully your familiarity with the Boolean connectives reminds you that or in English can take whole sentences on either side. Again, the English grammar is very complicated. So I can say Pia or Quinn is happy. And there you might say Pia is one side of the or sentence and that's not a whole sentence, that's just a name. But again, remember what I said about because. It's possible to put a whole sentence here and a whole sentence here. And that means it's gonna count as a connective in our purposes, even though it might have other uses in English too. I mean, technically speaking, when, if I say Pia or Quinn is happy, you might say, that's still being a sentential connective. It's just hidden in the surface grammar because really that the, the logical structure of that thing, Pia or Quinn is happy, is Pia is happy or Quinn is happy. Um, but we don't need to worry about the deep grammar too much. Um, just remember that basic test. Can I put a whole sentence here and here and get a grammatically well-formed sentence? Is it possible? And the answer is yes. So it counts as a connective. Is happy. You see, I can't do that with is happy. The only way to make a grammatically well-formed sentence with is happy is to put a name or some other noun out here or a noun phrase. I can't say Pia is happy is happy or the fire started is happy. Those, those are grammatically well, uh, those are grammatically wrong. Those are ungrammatical constructions. I have to put some kind of noun type bit of language out here, like a name or, or a definite description, like the tallest person in the room is happy. Um, but the tallest person in the room, that's, that's not a whole sentence. That's a noun phrase in English. All right, so the correct answer was those three are the, are the sentential connectives from those examples. All right, let's practice some translations into Boole now. So let's see if you can use this concept of the connectives to translate some things. Um, pause your videos now and see if you can figure out how to translate this sentence into Boole. Okay, we're gonna talk about the answer. Hopefully you came up with something. Here's some options. So, if you didn't figure it out, maybe you can just look at these and see which one is most possible. If you did figure it out, hopefully what you chose is on this list. So what did you want to go with? The interesting thing about the Boolean connectives, they're very expressively powerful. N neither nor is not a Boolean connective, but we can nonetheless use the Boolean connectives to translate some complex things like this. Now, which one is correct? Now, you see nor is a lot like the word or, so you might think this has to have a disjunction in it. You might think C and D are both correct, the answer is no, though. They're not both correct. Only one of them is correct. Um, so where do you put the negations? It's really, really important. Let's think through what the logical commitment of this thing is. If I say neither Stan nor Tamar likes stats, I'm going to use S for Stan and likes stats, T for Tamar likes stats, and I want to say they're not both, it's not true that they're both the case, or it's not true that either, true that either is the case. Neither nor like stats means Stan does not like stats, and it means Tamar does not like stats. Uh, they have to both not like stats for this to actually be a neither nor. So B is a correct answer. I need to say Stan does not like stats and Tamar does not like that stats. So even though there's no and in the surface grammar of this in English, when we translate these difficult ones into Boole, what we want to capture is not just the surface structure. We want to capture the logical commitment. And B does capture the logical commitment of that sentence in English. Now, there's another good answer, though. So B is not the only correct answer. Uh, D is not correct. if Because what this says is either Stan doesn't like stats or Tamar doesn't like stats. But this doesn't say one or the other doesn't like stats. It, it needs them both to not like stats. So technically speaking, C is the other correct answer. It's not the case that either one likes stats. And that really means they both don't like stats. So when I say B and C are both correct answers, it's not because there's two different uh, it's not because the English is ambiguous and it could mean two separate things. The English is perfectly clear and these actually mean the same thing in Boole. So what the concept here is that of equivalence. B and C are not the same sentence of Boole because to be the same sentence, you have to be the exact same string of symbols in the same order. They're not the same strings of symbols, but nonetheless, they have the exact same logical force. Whenever one is true, the other is true and vice versa. So from a logical point of view, they're equivalent. And that's why they count as both good translations. Now, how do we know they're equivalent? Well, we want a logical system that could prove that they're equivalent. So what we're going to see um, later on, once we add some more stuff to Boole, like its semantics and its proof theory, is we can prove the equivalence holds between B and C.
Now, what's critical here is where these, what's the extent of these connectives? Because uh, you can only understand sentence B or A or any of these sentences with multiple connectives if you know how to divide up and tell what the scope of each connective is. Scope is just another word for the extent of the connective, how much of the sentence it covers or governs. So we're gonna have an implicit rule that negation always governs as narrow scope as possible. So that means this connective right here, this negation, does not cover the S and the T. This one just is negating the S. And we have, we have order of priority rules like this in mathematics. So you're already familiar with this from algebra. Like if, if you see the sentence one plus two times three, there's an order of priority where you always do multiplication first. It's like that, this in, in logical terms, what that means is multiplication always has narrow scope. This applies to just these two bits. And then the one plus actually would then apply to that whole bit. Um, so if you want the negation to have a wider scope, if I'm not just negating the S, if I want to negate this whole thing, I just use parentheses for grouping. And this here, the negation, is actually negating this whole chunk because the parentheses are keeping it together like that. Now, I just used a couple of words describing scope, like narrow and wide. So I want to test you to see if you know how these go. Um, here's a sentence in Boole. What I want you to tell me is which connectives, uh, which one has narrowest scope and which one has widest scope. So pause your videos now and see if you can figure it out. Okay, let's talk about the answer. Now, <clears throat> there's not always a unique connective with narrowest scope. Actually, so when I asked you that question, which one has narrow scope, there's actually two good answers. This negation has narrow scope because it's just on this A. Now, I said negation, the rule is negation has as narrow scope as possible, but that doesn't mean it has narrow scope because this negation here is why is governing this whole chunk because of the grouping, it does not have narrow scope. So something has narrow scope only if it's operating merely on atomic sentences. So this disjunction also has narrow scope because it's operating on just these two bits. So um, the scope, you can think of scoping, a good way to, to, to visualize scope is to underline things. So if I wanna underline the scope of this thing, I'm gonna underline it and everything that it's operating on, the two disjuncts in this case. So there's the scope of that one. Now, how about the other one with narrow scope? I can underline the negation and everything that it is operating on. So these are my two narrow scope connectives. Of course, that only loves, leaves one more thing. Um, so this negation is operating on that. Oh, okay, I didn't mention this one, the blue negation. Here's the scope of the blue negation. I underline it and then what it's operating on, which is this complex sentence. So the widest scope connective, that's the one that operates on the entire sentence. So what's this, the conjunction here? This is the answer for the wide scope connective because it's operating on this, the underlying part here, and its other conjunct is this thing, this here. So there's always one connective which governs the entire sentence. That's called the main connective. Uh, and so the conjunction is the right answer. The main connective is always the connective with widest scope. And even though there's not always a unique connective with narrowest scope, there is always a unique connective with widest scope. Um, oh, actually, well, that's sort of untrue. I said that we can have these sentences. I'm going to just sort of make this up on the fly. Sorry. P and Q and R. This is the one um, weird case. Uh, let's see if I can make this bigger so it's intelligible. Um, so I guess let me take back what I said. You, you might say in some ways, because we're allowing these constructions, both of these have um, wide, widest scope. So, um, so these long strings are technically speaking the exception where there's multiple ones with similarly wide scope. I guess technically speaking, we said this is shorthand because conjunction is a binary connective. We can just make up an arbitrary rule that says something like, if there is no uh, single main connective because we have a string of ands or a string of ors, technically speaking, we'll just group from left to right. And if, that's the, if we use that rule, then this one will always be, um, there will still always be a widest connective. Um, so in some sense, uh, the way that we stipulate our logical system will help solve this problem. Um, so, uh, but I don't want you to worry about how these stipulations go. It, um, those constructions are not, are not really actually tricky. They're, they're very simple to understand. So, um, so as long as we're not dealing with one of those main string, one of those long strings of ands and ors, then there always will be a widest scope connective. Let's just leave it at that and not make you memorize any other um, arbitrary rules. Okay, thanks.